Let's talk about accessibility, usability, and older adults. And I'm Erin Ullman, by the way. I should introduce myself. My name is Erin Ullman, and um, the best way to contact me is either on Twitter or through email. My email is erin.ullman at gmail.com. If you want to follow up, I love talking about user experience, usability, accessibility, it's something I feel very strongly about, and love to chat. All right. so. I'm going to do a quick overview of accessibility and universal design considerations. And um, when we think about accessibility in terms of web design and technology, really what we're thinking about a lot of times is vision. So there's a lot of discussion around accessibility for people who are blind. And blind is actually not the only visual disability. There are people with low vision who need reading glasses or magnification. and um, we're also talking about people who can't hear very well. The web is less of a medium of hearing, so it's not as big of a concern unless we're Netflix or um, something where, you know, podcasts where you have to hear the content. Um, accessibility is also about motor ability, dexterity. Can someone use a mouse? And can they click keyboard clicks? If they can't, they're probably using. Um, a speech interpretation system like Dragon actually speaking or something. And then sort of the hardest ability or disability to design for is um, cognitive abilities. Um, so dyslexia or ADHD, um, autism. And they're very difficult because it's, designing for them is difficult because they're very personal. They can be very personal to the individual. And so then we have other considerations such as age. This is more universal design, inclusive design rather than disability. But age is definitely a consideration. And if you only try to design for vision, hearing, motor ability, cognitive ability, you're not going to meet the needs of older individuals, which is what the rest of this talk is sort of about. But there's also another group that we can include in our design consideration, which is um, non-native speakers. So. Um, people who aren't fluent, in our case, in English. They need special design considerations such as clearer language. Okay, so let's move on. When I think of accessibility, I think of it in two ways. There's making the technology accessible so that it's compatible with things like screen readers um, and basically that assistive technology. And this includes having good code, using ARIA, and alt text, and I'm not covering that at all today. Um, there are other presentations that given at WordCamps where the videos are available at wordcamp.tv. Highly recommend them. And, um, but what I want to talk about is accessible design, so the strategy of um, content, interaction design, design consistency, and how we can meet the needs of the older population. All right. I see people writing, so I'm afraid to advance, but I have 20 minutes, so. Um, yeah, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna advance. Three, two, one, <laughs> boom. Okay, so let's just get this out here. Old age is not a disability. Please don't think I'm saying that. It's not, um, but I think, I hope we can all agree that as we age, there's definitely a gradual decline in our ability to see and hear and unfortunately think. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not that old, but I need reading glasses. And if I don't have reading glasses, it gets to the point where I can't, I can't read, I can't do my job. And technically that could be considered a disability, but I wouldn't call it that. So. I've been, I've been interested in accessible design for a couple of years, but I became really interested in design considerations for the older population when I became the volunteer webmaster for the Oregon State Beekeepers Association. And beekeepers, great group of people. And what's interesting about them as an audience is that the, they range in age just from like six years old to 90 plus years old. And modern beekeeping has sort of been around in its current state, more or less, I'm speaking very broadly, for about a, at least 100 years. So we have all sorts of expertise across the spectrum. And 
the Oregon State Beekeepers Association has members in this range. So, as the webmaster, I need to meet the needs of all of these people, young and old. So, this is what the website looked like when I took it over. And you don't need to read, just take it in. <laughs> And before I became webmaster, my inclination was just wipe it out. Let's just get rid of it and start over. And then when I became webmaster, I was like, you know, I, I have some responsibility here, so maybe we should figure out why it is the way it is. And um, a little bit about this website. It evolved over about seven years. And over those seven years, there were many people who worked on it many, several, at least five. It was enough people that this, this is what you get. And those people all happen to be older adults. Now, let's pause for a moment. What do I mean by older adults? Do I mean adults over the age of 40, 50, 60, 70, 80? Well, there's no real clear sort of, this person is not an older adult, this person is. And we'll talk a little bit more about what makes older adults special. But, um, in general, let's just say we're talking about people over the age of probably 60. So, back to the site. There were a couple things that I noticed, I started noticing when I was really contemplating how we were going to redesign the site. The first is all of the links. There is so much navigation. There is navigation on the left, which is a very reasonable place for navigation, especially in 2003 when this started. And there's, there's navigation on the right. In fact, the most visited page on the website comes from the top link on the right. Um, not optimal from a design point of view, but that's where it is. The second most visited page is the second link on the left. So this was interesting, and I felt like if I thought about this more, I might learn something about how to redesign, how to do the redesign. And I sort of embraced this idea that Every, every decision that led to this website, it was made for a reason. It might not have been, you know, what I would consider to be a great reason, but it was, it was a valid reason to someone, and we have to respect that. And understanding these reasons helps us to understand the users, at least the types of users who created the site. And so I asked myself, why is the navigation so shallow? Why is there so much, why is there so much navigation? Why is the site code broken? And now I wanna say, I'm not suggesting that because someone made these decisions, this design is good. And it's, I'm not saying it's accessible because it's not. And I'm certainly, it's, it doesn't work for older adults, which is too bad. But um, this can tell us something. So, and then, and then I had this further question because on beekeeping websites, we have these things called swarm lists. And if you ever have a giant ball of bees appear in your yard somewhere between April and June, call a beekeeper. They want your bees. Bees are valuable. And you can find their information on beekeeping websites. You can find their name. You can find two of their phone numbers in some cases. You can, might find their email addresses. I'm a very private person, and so this horrifies me. But that's because of my experience. I mean, I don't have any like horrible stories, but... I mean, how many of you have publicly listed phone numbers in the phone book? I see one hand. I bet half of you do. And I bet the other half know that you don't, and you're never going to. We'd actually need to do some formal research on that. But so, so I had all these people who were completely fine with having this information available on a website in just plain HTML, but when I introduced the idea of having like a membership system where people could log in and manage their um, membership, there was serious angst, serious angst, to the point where we still don't really have a fully functioning membership system today. And you know that also makes me ask, why? Why is this going on? And so this led me to realize that enough of our user base are older users and they have perceptions and design needs that, that have influenced the design and comfort with web technologies. Okay, so let's talk about the, um, let's talk about older people. What does that mean? Okay, tangent. I'm gonna say a lot of things. I'm, I've already said a lot of things, but you might be saying, all right, Aaron, show me the research. 
At the end of my slide deck, I've included um, a list of resources from the AARP and um, the W3C that contain information about what I'm talking about. So at, after my presentation, if you're interested in this, please read those and that's where a lot of the stuff is coming from. Okay, so um, in 2004, there was a really big literature review on designing for older individuals, older adults. And the people who did this literature review and who were sort of studying how do we design for older adults, they, they thought it was useful to break these considerations down into four different characteristics. Um, one is age, and it's not just chronological age, but also um, maturity, the self-perceived age of the individual, their education, this all sort of contributed to this concept of age. Another characteristic is ability, and this is what accessibility addresses. So if you've designed your site for accessibility, you're gonna hit the ability characteristic pretty well. But this includes their vision abilities, their dexterity, the cognitive abilities. The next characteristic is aptitude, and this is sort of their aptitude for using technology. How comfortable are they with the web? They're, right now, our older adults are not digital natives. And, um, this sort of raises some design challenges for us because when we design, like um, we often start designing for ourselves or for a younger group of people who we can relate to as um, people who understand how the web works. So aptitude, often related to experience. And then finally, attitude. And this is, this is one that's really interesting. Um, the researchers found that older adults either sort of had this positive or negative attitude when it came to using technology. And those who had a positive attitude were more willing to take risk or to fail or to keep trying, but those who had a negative attitude towards their ability and to use the websites were very risk averse and afraid of failure. And that is not good. So a couple of statements here. Older adults are more likely to be uncertain about technology. And older adults are also more likely disproportionately negatively affected by deep hierarchy. All of us are negatively affected by a deep hierarchy because um, it requires more memory recall. It's a higher cognitive load on using a site, but older adults especially. And the reason for this is um, we talked about the cognitive abilities of, of people. In older adults, they, they might experience a gradual decline in cognitive, and this might be referred to as minor cognitive something. I don't remember the last word, it's no good. But um, sort of minor cognitive issues, we'll just call them issues. And this is usually manifests as um, diminished short-term memory and diminished focus. And so this, this has a lot of ramifications in design. It means that um, with a diminished short-term memory, um, maybe they don't remember where they've been. So it's incredibly important to um, show when links have been visited versus not visited. Otherwise, they might not know they visited a link. Um, but this also has to do with just recalling where they are in a navigation hierarchy. So also, older adults who don't like to fail will not try again when they do, which is no good. I mean, my two-year-old, he fails all the time and he keeps trying, but when my grandmother fails, she won't try again which is, you know, I think it's too bad, but that's just her, that's just her behavior. So for older adults especially, it's, it's really important that our designs enable success. <laughs> and finally, this one just breaks my heart. When seniors fail, and this, this is from 2004, they blamed themselves 90% of the time. Oh my God, I mean, that's horrible. When we're talking about usability, the problem is always on us, the designers. We make a website, we code the website, we design the website. If there is a usability problem, that is our fault. And so when we have this population of people who think they can't use the site because they're dumb or because they're old, that is not okay. That is so sad. All right. So that said, 
let's go back to my question. Why are people okay with exposing information, excessive personal contact information that can be accessed by crawlers, but they're not okay with a login system? And I finally decided, well, it has to do with that, um, it has to do with their experience. You know, older adults grew up with phone books. Makes total sense. White pages, look up someone's number, totally cool. We don't have robots that are crawling physical white pages. Not as much danger there. But the login system, if you went to Ben Martin's talk, he gave a very lovely description of how we think of malicious hackers. Dark people, freedom hating, is pretty awesome. But they, the experience of, of malicious attacks are, you know, Target or the government hack, which was horrible. And they come and they steal your login information and they get your credit cards and your address. And oh my God. And so this angst came from their experience, their life experiences. Okay, so back to the beekeepers. 10 minutes, good, perfect. All right, back to the beekeepers. So I talked to them and one of the things that I really picked up on was their very consistent use of their own individual terminology. And so for instance, one man, his name is Dewey. He, he wanted to be able to contribute to a WordPress website and he called everything an article. And we, as WordPress practitioners, we think of them as posts, right? We talk about posts, we talk about pages, but to Dewey and other people, post didn't make any sense. There was no experience with post or just this frame of reference, but he's grown up with newspapers and he's written in scholarly journals and they write articles. So, um, so I started listening to the things and the words that are being used by the older populations. And this was actually incredibly effective. And what I think is also one of the benefits of WordPress is that we can change the terminology of WordPress really easily. Now, WordPress is actually two different user experiences. There's the front end user experience of WordPress, and then there's the administrative experience of WordPress. And these are completely different. And so to people not familiar with WordPress, or blogs in general, this different administrative experience and the different front end experience can be kind of problematic. Are they even on the same website? Valid question. So when I was creating the website, I made the decision to create a bunch of extra um, custom post types. Didn't need it. This could have been completely handled by taxonomy and categories, but by creating the custom post types, that could be guest articles or the apiary calendar or the library. I could match the mental models that were in our users, especially the users who are gonna be using the administrative area, like Dewey, who thinks of things as articles. So that was really awesome. All right. So I have a bunch of do this points, and we can talk more about these and questions and where these come from, but things to do that will help older adults use a website better. Have broad top level navigation and shallow hierarchy. So like your top level menu, very broad in topic. And this, this helps all users, but especially older adults and try to have as shallow of a hierarchy as possible. So it's easier to find the content and easier to get back out of. Um, breadcrumbs are great once you're deep into a website, but they don't help you if you're trying to find that deep page. Sitemaps will though, so have a sitemap. Also avoid changing the navigation too much. And the reason for this is, tell me if this sounds familiar, older adult makes a um, document of how to do something, a process. Let's say how to back up their computer. They open a Word document, they just write down, do this, do this, do this. And so when you change the navigation, you could be destroying their list. Now, unfortunately, sites change, navigation evolves, but if you have a, a large population of older users, this is definitely something to keep in mind. Also, I thought this was interesting. Um, 
Older adults felt much more comfortable with action-oriented links. This does help every age group, but it was particularly beneficial for the older adults. And instead of just having links that were like nouns, like accounts or um, contact or um, newsletter, they were faster and more comfortable with things like go-to accounts or, um, well, contact is kind of a verb, but contact us, or um, read the newsletter that did a better job of communicating what would happen when they clicked on a link. Uh, like I said before, clearly indicate visited links and not visited links. So um, this, again, it benefits people with uh, the short-term um, short memory issues. Use drop-down menus judiciously. This is um, very similar to um, navigation, have a shallow navigation. Um, also avoid pop-ups and sliders. Pop-ups are wonderful. They can be used to great effect or they can be terrible, but they are problematic for the older adults because where did they come from? Why are they there? Do I have to do something with this? And um, we know probably not. You probably don't have to do anything with it, but that is from our experience. Also, by the same token, sort of sliders are problematic. What happened to the previous picture? Where did it go? How can I get it back? And unfortunately, some of the interaction with sliders is getting more and more um, hard to find. I'm having problems with sliders lately, and it's weird. But um, just avoid sliders if you have a large older population. Uh, in general, larger text is great. My uh, fondest hope and dream for the web is that the default text size will become 20. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, just have really clear writing and clear error messages. Use positive voices. Um, so that's using like, do this, do that, as opposed to do not do this, do not do that. Um, clear writing, clear error messages, active voice. Um, don't obfuscate. And then use their language as much as possible. This, this will really help them just orient. This will help anyone orient with a website. And finally, I know this isn't vogue with design right now, but use a text with icons. All right. And so finally, my last statement is above all, talk to them. You have to talk with them. Now there's a caveat to this. So we've talked a lot about how older adults have these, uh, have usability needs based on their experiences and based on their preferences for risk aversion. Because of that, we have to be a little sensitive to doing research. Talking and having conversations is, is fine, but if you're gonna do some formal uh, usability research, that should be handled a little bit more delicately. And the, um, I think it's the AARP, um, designing websites for older adults article sort of speaks to that, but um, yeah. So talk to them, listen, and that will that will tell you a lot about what needs to be done for them. And so finally, resources. Um, I'll definitely make sure to make these slides available online. I hopefully the WordCamp will help with that. Um, but there's, there's a great assortment of articles for designing for older adults. Some of them are kind of old, so that means that some of the material might be dated. The older adults of 10 years ago had different abilities than the older adults today, and they'll have different abilities than the older adults 10 years from now. So just consider. I think we have some few minutes. Are there any questions, comments? Yes. Yeah, so the comment was that there's a great widget for um, text resizer. And then the follow-up question was, but do they use it? And that's an excellent question. Um, some of the research found that older adults don't know what accessibility is. They don't know what a screen reader is. They don't know that there are tools available to them. So it is a great tool. I love those. Um, but do they use it? That would be something that you would need to investigate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent point. So if you label it, make it clear. Some older adults really benefit from instructions. Those tend to be the people who think more negatively about their abilities also. Yes? How do you feel about 
Mega, oh, mega menus. I would say for older adults, mega menus are terrible um, just because there's all that information. It's that, it's that deep hierarchy um, thought. It's... It might. That would be something that I would test personally. I don't, I don't like mega menus, so not really an issue for me. But if you have them tested, if it's a concern, yeah. I was just thinking about font size using EMs versus fixed size. Any thoughts on that? That is a. So the question was: Is there any thoughts on using EMs versus fixed size? From an accessibility standpoint, <laughs> the. Really what accessibility guidelines say is that you have to be able to change the font size. And so that means that from an accessibility standpoint, it doesn't matter if you're using EMs or pixels. But um, I would say EMs would be better because they're, I think they're easier to sort of manage. But that's a good question. As long as they can be resized, it's fine. Yeah, it's sort, of, it's sort of a different issue. Um, accessibility considerations say are really accessibility for younger people. So with older people, they need instructions or they need to know that it's possible. Yes. Can you give us the URL Oh, sure. Um, it's not perfect. <laughs> I'll give you that. Um, it's orsba.org. Um, there are definitely issues with it. It could be better, but yeah. Anything else? You have a icons, so this, this goes back to the experience. We have experience with icons and we know what they mean. I mean, there's been great debate with the hamburger icon because that's new and we, a lot of people don't know what they mean. And we can, we can sort of extrapolate that back further. Do older individuals know what a floppy icon mean? Some ages might not. Um, some of the older individuals, they didn't have computers in the workplace and they didn't, um, they just don't have the experience or the context or the reference. I think today it's better than it was 10 years ago regarding icons, but if you wanna be safe, have text along with the icon. Do we have time for more questions? I uh, no. Okay, so Sorry. thank you. I will be here, here, I'll be here all day and um, Contact me. My name is Erin Ullman. I'm Erin Ullman on Twitter. Happy to talk about this stuff. Thank you. Thanks, Erin.